Welcome everybody, so excited to have you in class today. Today's class is all about the Constitutional Convention, which you can imagine at the Constitution Center is one of our favorite things to talk about. Now today we're gonna to talk about the Constitutional Convention and what came out of it. But even before that, we're gonna to talk to about why did we have a Constitutional Convention in September 17, 1787. So as we think about this and we dive into it, we look at the United States Constitution. And if you wanna dive into this more, I'll drop in the chat in a second, the interactive constitution. These words are from the interactive constitution. This is how we lay it out. The United States Constitution begins with we the people, that preamble has seven articles. The preamble and the seven articles are what we call the structural constitution, literally sets up the structure of our government. And then we have 27 amendments. Those first 10 amendments, many of us know as the Bill of Rights. So today we're gonna to dive into what is the constitution in the first place? This is our big question for Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center. And then Tom is also gonna help us answer all these questions. Why did the founding generation decide to write that constitution? How did the United States Constitution differ from the Articles of Confederation, which was our governing document prior to the Constitution? And what are some of the main compromises that were reached by the delegates? And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about those compromises and the debates around those compromises. So like I said, we are lucky enough to be here with one of our top scholars, Tom Donnelly. So Tom, let's begin. What is the Constitution? <laughs> Big question, Curry. And Hi, everyone. Great to see you. Thanks for being with us. Uh, so the Constitution, the easiest way to answer it, Curry, is it, it, it's something I can hold in my hand right here. And so the things I really want to emphasize about the Constitution are one, they're the fundament, it's the fundamental law of our nation. You know, Congress passes laws, state legislatures, they pass laws, local governments pass laws. But the Constitution is the foundation of it all. And what makes it so special is one, it's written. Um, so that was an innovation for America. Remember, the British also have a constitution, but it's unwritten. It's a collection of various traditions and laws, et cetera, that make up their fundamental law. We thought, no, 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 we're going to write it all down. We're going to write it into a document. And the other big thing is that what gave this document life? It wasn't just James Madison sitting in the Constitutional Convention with George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. All they did there was propose a new framework of government. They then sent it along to the state, sent it along to the American people to say yes or no. Madison has much powerful language where he says, you know, what I've done, what we did in Philadelphia, it was nothing more than just a paper sitting on my desk. It's going to be the American people that breathe it life or say no. And so that's the root of everything is popular sovereignty. And I think that that's unbelievably fascinating and this idea that it's the constitution is powered by the people. So I guess the next question is really important. Like how did we get here in the first place? So the constitution is signed by many of the delegates on September 17th, 1787, but there's a lot of history that's going on prior to that. What kind of world are we living in after the declaration and after we win the revolution? How are we working together? And what's not working really too? Yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting and a turbulent world, I think is the way to think about it. So, you know, the, when we think about the new constitution, the one that we're going to get in Philadelphia ratify after that, the thing to remember is that it wasn't our first framework of government. So we had a national government, a national framework before that called the Articles of Confederation. And the big thing to remember about the Articles is that it was a weak national government. You have the language there, Curry, which I love. It was a league of friendship. And so the way of thinking about the Articles of Confederation in a certain way is we were more like the United Nations than the United States of America. So the Articles of Confederation left a lot of power, a lot of independence to the states. And the national government itself had few powers. So what are some big things we would think of a national government would have that the Articles didn't? Well, the Articles didn't have the power of taxation, didn't have the power to regulate interstate commerce. It didn't have the power to raise an army. It, it, when leading the American people, the Articles of Confederation largely relied on the voluntary involvement of the states. And so if you wanted to fund national projects, the, the Confederation Congress had to ask the states to voluntarily contribute money. And you can imagine how eager many of these states were to contribute <laughs> money. Um, and so you can see already there are structural factors, this weak national government, 
um, uh, we run into problems. And you know, you may think, sure, this is an experiment in new government. Why can't we make it better over time? Surely we'll learn, we'll amend it, we'll change the document. But the Articles of the Confederation required unanimity for any amendments. So every state, all 13 of the states had to agree, and it will surprise no one that we agreed on no amendments prior to the Constitutional Convention. So we have this, it's this weird moment where we have, you know, many, many people think there are problems with the Articles of Confederation. We think that the government is too weak. We think it needs changes, but the structure of that framework itself makes it impossible for us to change it. And then I see you have the 13 state governments also on the screen there, Curry. The other thing during this period is we've created state constitutions. And so again, it's this amazingly exciting moment, state by state coming up with new frameworks of government. And generally speaking, those governments have very strong legislatures and very weak governors. And so we learn from that experience as well. And Linda pointed out a great point in the chat that it was an intention, the Articles of Confederation were intentionally weak. Um, because it was just a league of friendship. We agree to work together, but we're not given, we're very paranoid. <laughs> we're not gonna give anybody more power than others. So when I think about this time period and the fact that there was no way to amend it, to fix it, to make it better, there's a lot of lessons learned, both by the state constitutions and what's working successfully, and also by this league of friendship and what is holding them back to work as a unit. And things are really coming to a boil. It's coming to a boil among the states, but also from outside entities like Spain, like Portugal, like you know France is starting its own revolution so they can't really help us anymore, but England as well. So when I think about all these big things coming to a boil, it always brings up usually in every eighth grade or fifth grade history teacher's classroom, the story of Shay's Rebellion. So can you tell us that story? <laughs> Absolutely. And I love that point, Linda. It's a great the reminder about, yes, of course, when we're creating these new governments, we are very afraid of giving a new national government a lot of power. And we really, really value states because they're close to the people having power. And so, we, you know, anyway, I just wanted to sort of telegraph that that's such a great point to keep in mind. Uh, but to Shea's Rebellion, Curry, yeah, it's this really interesting event. It's an important event at the time. Um, and it's but it's symbolic of a lot of the problems that we're seeing during this period. So this is, you know, 1786 into 1787. What's happening in America? Well, we're having a lot of economic difficulties. We're having a lot of economic difficulties. So we see, you know, farmers, many ordinary Americans in a lot of debt. We see people losing their homes, losing their farms. We see, you know, different states putting up barriers, trying to protect their businesses from competition from other states. But so we see this economic turmoil happening, many people looking to government to try to help them. And the Articles of Confederation, again, it, they're so weak that they don't really have the power to adapt new national policies to help people more broadly. And so we have Shays Rebellion, it takes place in Western Massachusetts. It's a group of farmers, many of them former soldiers in the Revolutionary War, who are experiencing what a lot of Americans are experiencing, a lot of debt, people losing their farms, a feeling that their state government, the government in Boston, so they're in Western Massachusetts, the government all the way in Boston, that those elites aren't hearing their voice, aren't hearing their problems, aren't trying to make their lives better. And so they gather together, they join together, they arm themselves, and they're led by Daniel Shays. Who's Daniel Shays? Well, he's a 39-year-old from out in Western, Western Massachusetts. He himself, a Revolutionary War veteran, he fought at Bunker Hill, he fought at Lexington. And so these farmers led by Shays are mar they want to march from Western Pennsylvania, uh, Western, you know, uh, uh, Western Massachusetts all the way to Boston. And at, along the way, they're, you know, shutting down courts to keep people from foreclosing on farms. They're shutting down debtors prisons. And they're, they're, they're really planning. They want to get to Boston so they can speak directly to their representatives. And so what happens? Well, the, the national government doesn't have the power to raise troops, so it's powerless before this instance of mob violence. And instead, we need the Massachusetts militia to come out and put it down. And so for the founding generation, for George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, supporters of a stronger national government, they look at this moment with horror. They wonder, they see Shays' Rebellion as an example of mob rule, mob violence. And they wonder, is Shays' Rebellion just gonna be the first example of this? Are we going to see a wave of this sort of violence as governments aren't taking care of the people's concerns? And then they look at the national government and say the national government 
doesn't start to address the genuine problems that these people have, and furthermore, doesn't even have the power to raise the troops necessary to put down rebellion. And so they call for a new convention to put together a stronger national government. The Confederation Congress answers this call and says, let's meet in Philadelphia, let's states send delegates to Philadelphia for the explicit purposes of revising the Articles of Confederation. There it is, there's the language from Congress. Why are we having this convention? Quote, for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles. As we know, James Madison, some of his colleagues, uh, they had other ideas. Yeah, and I, I think this is fascinating and I wanna dive into the people that actually show up, who they are, <laughs> what their like lived experiences are and what, energy they bring to it. So this is Independence Hall, which at the time was the Pennsylvania State House, which is an unbelievably fascinating building. If you ever come to Philadelphia, you cannot miss it. It's the first World Heritage City in the United States. So an amazing spot to be on. They're in Philadelphia from May to September. Tom, when we think about the people that come to the room, we think about the big names that are there that because of Shay's Rebellion are talked into coming and they need their names and their presence at this convention to keep it going, to keep it positive, but to also give it legitimacy because there had been failed conventions before this. But at the same time that many of the people in the room are younger and have lived under the Articles of Confederation and have watched the weaknesses affect them directly. So can you talk about who's in the room, who's not in the room? Because every single time you're in our recreation of this room at the Constitution Center, you're always asked about one major guy and you're like, nope, he's not here. So let's talk about them too. Um, and then what states show up for the convention and what states do not? Sure, so yeah, you can see at the front of the room there is George Washington. The, you know, the indispensable American, he's the one, it's, it's, it's Hamilton, it's Madison convincing him to show up at the convention. And he's the one alone that really brings legitimacy to this occasion. Um, and remember, just like you said, Terry, people were learning from their lived experiences under the articles for George Washington. He remembers what it was like to try to lead the American military under a weak national government. And he remembers his angry troops who were serving their nation and didn't even get pay from the national government. And so he's thinking about the ways in which we need a stronger national government that can truly lead a great nation. We see, uh, we see Benjamin Franklin there in that comfy looking uh, blue outfit seated in the chair. And so here in the convention in Philadelphia, we're embarking on a new project and we have the two most famous Americans there, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin. Who's not there? Well, the two famous omissions are John Adams. He's in England and Thomas Jefferson, he's in France doing America's business out in Europe and so, so, so jealous of the people in the rooms. You have you know, Jefferson frantically writing letters to Madison trying to figure out what's going on. And you have John Adams, you know, surely stewing because he himself wrote influential, his thoughts on government were influential in the framing of state constitutions. And he was the main drafts person of the Massachusetts constitution, another influential one. And you're right, Curry, the last thing that, that's always worth focusing on is the people in the room are really young. So, you know, Franklin's old, he's in his 80s, but the average age of the delegates is 42. So this is a new generation of Americans looking to embark on a new American project and build a new framework of government. The last group that was not represented here at the convention is, the, is Rhode Island. They didn't send delegates. They were skeptical of a strong national government. And so Rhode Island is not represented in the Constitutional Convention. They get a lot of work done in that long, hot, smelly summer. Let's just be honest. It's a closed convention. So they, they close these windows here with shutters um, just for a fun factoid around it the, that many people knew that this was hard and difficult work they were doing. So they didn't want the noises of the carriages to be very loud on the Belgium block that surrounds it. So they laid down manure and straw outside of those windows <laughs> So the carriages wouldn't be so loud. So Philadelphia is not known for being clean at this time period. It's also hot, smelly, and the windows are closed. And those guys are wearing wool other than Franklin in that beautiful velvet that thing he's got on, <laughs> silk and wool. Um, but they get a lot done. So when we talk about what they get done, they get done the structural constitution, which starts with the preamble. And Tom, can you do us like a real quick story walk through the articles that the seven articles they do write? Sure. So the, the Articles 1 through 3 give us our framework of government. These are the rules of the game. Article 1 lays out Congress, its powers, it's going to make the laws. Article 2 lays out the executive branch led by a single president 
responsible for enforcing the laws. And Article 3 outlines the judicial branch, but the Supreme Court is its highest court, which is tasked with interpreting the laws. Now, the rest of the Constitution deals with a, a bunch of different important issues. Article 4 is addressing the relationship between the states, um, how we're going to admit new states, and the national government's power over the federal territories. Article 5 lays out the amendment process. And here, the framers, really, they want to make the amendment process easier than the Articles of Confederation. We get rid of the unanimity requirement, but it's still very demanding in how we, it, it's still very difficult, a constitutional amendment. Article 6 establishes the supremacy of national law over state law. So it makes the Constitution, it's the pinnacle of, of legal power in the United States. And then finally, Article 6 sets out how we're going to go about ratifying this new Constitution. And it's going to require nine out of 13 states. So again, it's abandoning the, the, the unanimity requirements of the Articles of Confederation. And what the framers effectively say is, yeah, that rule exists. But in the end, what we're doing here is we're setting out a proposal and we're sending it back to the people. If nine out of 13 states say it's good, that's good enough to establish rule by we the people. And I love that. It kind of begins with we the people and ends with the we the people have the choice on this document or not, which again is when we think about where did they get that idea? We, we know that this is how the Massachusetts state constitution was ratified. So they saw how well that worked and used it for this. So taking those lived experiences, both good and bad and building a better, a better program, a better system, a better plan. But it wasn't easy and they had lots of debates and we always talk about how civil they were, but they were still heated and they were still unbelievably difficult and they had big compromises. Some we could say were good and some people can, we can say they were, maybe they made those choices that we wouldn't have agreed with. But let's dive through those big compromises. Here are the big four, the great compromise around the compromises around the electoral college and the presidency three-fifths compromise and the slave trade clause. So do you want to start and kind of leap forward into the debate on representation? Sure. So yes, let's start with the Connecticut or Great Compromise. And what this is, is there are battles between the small states and the large states over how we're going to distribute power in the new government. And this is especially a debate over how we're going to organize Congress and how, where power is going to lie. And this was so important to the founding generation because they predicted Congress would be the most powerful part of the government. So it really, really mattered how we were going to go about structuring power. And so we see, in many ways, a battle between small states and large states. The large states, their, their plan is largely laid out in something called the Virginia Plan, which ends up framing a lot of the debates here over congressional representation. Um, it's the brainchild of James Madison. And what the Virginia Plan says is that we're going to have a Congress, we're going to have a legislative branch, it's going to be distributed into two houses. So we're going to have effectively what we have today, which is a U.S. House of Representatives and a U.S. Senate. Now, this is different than the Articles of Confederation, which only had one house. So here we're moving to two houses of Congress. We call that bicameralism. And then the most important thing for this debate over representation is that the Virginia plan argues that we should end up deciding the amount of representatives each state gets. It should be based on their population. So the larger the state, the more representatives that you have in Congress. And the Virginia plan says that should be true in both houses of Congress. And so you have important delegates pushing for this idea. You have James Madison of Virginia, James Wilson of Pennsylvania. Now, what do these two delegates have in common? They're from very large states. So they're arguing from large states that population is, should really determine how much representation their states get. But they're rooting it in the basic principle of popular sovereignty. That in the end, of course, power should be lodged where the people live. Um, and so that's the big idea there on their side. But the flip side, you can imagine how these small states respond to this. They don't respond very well. And so we have an alternative plan known as the New Jersey plan. It's put forward by New Jersey's William Patterson. And so what the New Jersey plan effectively says is, no, 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 no. we're not going to organize the legislature by population. We're going to do it just like we did with the Articles of Confederation, equal state representation, each state gets the same number of votes in this new Congress. We are not going to leave the Articles of Confederation where we have equal power and enter a new, more powerful government with less power. That makes no sense to us. And so this is the New Jersey plan. And so again, we have this battle. On the one hand, the Virginia plan says representation based on population. On the other hand, we see the New Jersey plan, representation based on equal state representation. Every state gets the same number of seats in the Congress. So no matter whether you're a big state or a small state. And so what is the Great or Connecticut Compromise? It effectively splits the difference. 
Now, it's called the Connecticut Compromise because it's brokered by Connecticut's Roger Sherman, who's an important sort of negotiator, compromiser, power broker in the convention. We don't talk to talk about it as much as we do, you know, Washington or Madison, uh, but he's a really, really important figure. And what Sherman gets, gets uh, the states, the delegates to agree on is that we're going to have a U.S. House of Representatives and we're going to do that the way the Virginia plan says. That, so the U.S. House of Representatives will be based on population. The larger the state, the more, the greater number of representatives. And then the U.S. Senate is going to be based on equal state population. We're gonna take that from the New Jersey plan. And so every state, whether it's as big as Virginia or as small as Rhode Island, they're gonna get two United States senators. Now, in the end, we, you know, when we think of compromise, we often think, well, they must've come together and agreed to this and there was some sort of consensus, not on this issue, not on this issue. It passed by a single vote, James Madison, James Wilson, the supporters of the Virginia plan were, were absolutely devastated that they lost that issue when it came to the US Senate. But in the end, enough delegates came together to agree to this compromise and it allowed the delegates to move past the debate that wound up really bogging them down for quite a period of time. Tensions got high. We wondered if we'd be able to solve it. In the end, the compromise is great, not necessarily because it's like the most creative compromise you would ever think of, but it was enough to bring enough delegates delegates along so they can move on to other issues. And and I think that's like almost the reframing I had to put it in my brain was it's not about like this perfect invention and and um, Warren points out like oh these ideas are coming from the House of Lords so often the delegates are taking t great ideas from lots of different areas and recombining it in new ways to create this constitution. So I think it's like the best example of like, you don't have to build something perfectly new. You can just take and tweak and make better. Um, but really that great compromise comes into all that work that gets to a point where they can move forward. And I love that, re that reframing. Now when we think about the presidency, the presidency is another heated debate that they have. It seems like such a given because they all were like, oh, George Washington, check, we know what we're doing. But who, how, what, all those things were really hard for them to figure out. So what were the debates over the presidency? What were the key questions that they had? And then how did they solve them? Oh boy, they found the presidency so vexing. Because again, I, I think you're right, Corey. It's important to remember many of these framers, they're children of the enlightenment. So they're trying to learn from what's happened in the United States, what's happened, what's happening in other countries, what's happened in history. I mean, what does Madison do before the convention? He has Jefferson send him a bunch of books from Europe and he, he tries to sit down and study all of the great republics in world history. I mean, it's, it's an ambitious and exciting project, but with the presidency, the founding generation, including Madison, didn't exactly know what they wanted. They knew that they wanted George Washington as the first president. And because of this, it made the debates a little easier because they figured we'll put some basic outlines in there in the constitution and George Washington and by the force of his reputation will establish important precedents. And he did along long broader dimensions. But in the end, you know, when they're thinking about the presidency, they look out at the world and they say, you know, they look at their own state constitutions and they say, no, 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 those governors, they are too weak to govern a great nation or to stand up to Congress. Checks and balances won't work with that. With those sorts of with those sorts of, of, of executives. On the flip side, they look to Europe and they see powerful monarchs. And they say, no, 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 we don't want, we don't want that either. You know, we just fought a revolution to throw to cast off the powers of a king. We were abused by King George III and his royal officials. That's part of why we had a revolution. We're not going to install something like that. And so as they're putting together the presidency, they're trying to find something in between their own weak governors and the very strong monarchs they see in Europe. And they so so they settle on the American presidency. And in many ways, this debate breaks down into these four categories. They go back and forth about each of these important issues, how to elect a president, how long the president's term should be, whether the president should be allowed to run for re-election, and the question of impeachment and removal. And what they notice with these debates is that as they decide one of these issues, their views change on the others. And so, you know, they say, what do they settle on? Well, for how long, how long should the president's term be? They settle on four years. And this is actually a very long period of time in context. Governors often serve for only one year. They believe deeply in something known as the rotation in office, that they want the, 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 the representatives to have to face the people on a very consistent basis. And, 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 and so because of that, the president has a little bit more independence, a longer term than you see in some of the other executives. Should the president be allowed to run for re-election? They say yes. They say yes, the president should be able to run for re-election. But this is where Washington steps in and sets an important precedent. He only runs for re-election once. 
after he becomes president. And this precedent, this tradition carries on from Washington all the way until FDR. So it has powerful, a powerful force. They settle on the question of impeachment and removal, a two-step process beginning in the House, ending in the Senate. It allows for the Congress to come together to check abuses of office by the president. And then finally, how do they elect the president? Well, they try to find something in between James Wilson's idea, which he's pushing for direct popular election of the president, and what many of the delegates thought, which was that we want election by Congress. And so the Electoral College gave each side a little bit of what it wanted for the James Wilsons, and he, he was one of few voices who called for popular election, but he was an influential delegate. For him, he thought the Electoral College is probably the closest I'm going to get to the direct election of the president. And over time, you know what? I think America is going to become more democratic. And so I think I'm going to win out in the long term. And in many ways, Wilson was, you know, uh, made good predictions there. And for those who supported congressional election of the president, they thought, well, what we're putting in place is the Electoral College. A president only becomes president if they get a majority of the vote in the Electoral College. If there's no majority, the presidential election then goes to the House of Representatives. And the founding generation predicted that after George Washington, very few figures would actually have a national reputation such that they could carry a majority of the Electoral College. And so they thought, as a matter of practice, 19 elections out of 20 would go to the House of Representatives, as George Mason put it. And we may look back and say, well, that didn't happen, but it wasn't a crazy prediction at the time. And so what is the Electoral College? Well, this is the system that we have. It's that in November, when we go to the polls and vote, we don't vote directly for president or vice president. We vote for electors who in December will then go on to cast a vote for president and vice president. Um, and you know, in the end, again, uh, someone could, could you know, win the overall popular vote uh, but not win the Electoral College. And we've seen that multiple times in American history. But it's, again, it's the system that the way to think about it is a compromise between direct popular election and congressional election of the president. So our final big kind of debate it brings up like two big areas. Um, and it's around enslavement in the Constitution and enslavement in America. So the debates over slavery come to play when we talk about representation, when we talk about slavery in general. But I, as a framing reference point, and I found this kind of stat pretty fascinating. There are 55 delegates to the convention over that summer. You know, you always get stuck on how many people signed it and how many people didn't sign it. But when we think about the influence of people over the summer, there's 55 delegates, and some of them are unbelievably influential in this discussion. And I think of Luther Martin. Um, but out of those 55 delegates, 20 of them had directly or indirectly enslaved people in their lives or their families. Um, so when we think about these debates, these are some of the most crushing and crucial debates that we have at the convention that almost tears it apart. And the two areas that we'll look over is debates around the three-fifths clause and representation and debates around the end of the slave trade. Um, so let's begin with the three-fifths clause. Absolutely, and this is in many ways the most important structural compromise over slavery at the convention. It goes back to that question of representation. And so remember, the US House of Representatives after the Great Compromise, the representatives there are gonna be based on state population. So this debate over the three-fifths clause is a debate over how are we going to count enslaved people for purposes of representation in the US House of Representatives. And so we see slaveholding states say, that's easy, we should count enslaved people as five fifths of a person, as a full person. So we should effectively get additional representation for each enslaved person that we hold. But then we also at the convention had anti-slavery voices, of opponents of slavery who argue that no, 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 that is absolutely crazy. How could you possibly argue that? And so these delegates argue that in fact, enslaved people should count as zero fifths of a person. The argument being, you know, you don't actually represent the interests of enslaved people. You're obviously not going to allow them to vote. You grant them no rights. How in the world can we grant you representation based on the number of enslaved people that you hold? That seems to go against the very principles of the revolution and of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And so in the end, we see this battle between five-fifths, zero-fifths, and again, we end up seeing a compromise brokered by Roger Sherman. And he says, no, neither of those positions are right. Let's settle on three fifths. Enslaved people count as three fifths of a person for purposes of representation in the US House of Representatives. And this ends up being an important compromise because over time, it's a compromise about where power is going to lie in Congress, the more representatives, the more political power you have. And this reverberates across the different institutions of government. So obviously it boosts 
Southern representation in the US House of Representatives and their power in Congress. But this affects the Electoral College. The number of votes each state gets in the Electoral College is linked to the number of representatives in Congress. So the Southern states get a boost in the Electoral College, so a boost in who gets selected president. And then that president's gonna go on to appoint justices on the Supreme Court. And so you even have an influence then from the three-fifths compromise to Congress, to the Electoral College, to who sits as president and then who sits on the Supreme Court. It is it's unbelievably powerful how much this you know, gives more power all over for the slaveholding states. And that's why we see so many of the presidents up until Lincoln, not all of them, but so many of them are slave owning presidents or families of slave owning presidents. Now, the other kind of big debate around this is over the, um, the slave trade clause and when the end of the slave trade. They, they compromise at 20 years but are there pushes for this to end right away and to not ever allow the slave trade to the international slave trade to continue? Not that absolutely. That, that stays until the end of the Civil War. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we, we end up seeing, again, battle lines drawn where we see slaveholding states arguing, you know, we are not going to sign any constitution that eliminates our power uh, to import enslaved people from Africa. I mean, they really, they're, they're, South Carolina, um, threatens to walk out of the convention over this issue. So you see a radical push to say, no, no, the national government and Congress should have no power over the international slave trade. But then you have plenty of voices, including some slaveholders at the convention, arguing that, no, this, this the international slave trade is brutal. It's inhumane. Congress must have the power to ban this. And so you see a battle there. And it, just to give you a sense of these debates, here's Luther Martin. You had mentioned him. He's from Maryland. Here's what he had to say about the slave trade. He attacked the slave trade in these debates as, quote, inconsistent with the principles of the revolution and dishonorable to the American character. And then in response, we see John Rutledge of South Carolina, who in many ways is the most powerful pro-slavery voice of the convention, explaining the position of the, the Deep South. So here he's representing South Carolina in his own state, North Carolina, Georgia. And what he says in reply to those like Martin is that religion and humanity had nothing to do with this question. Interest alone is the governing principle with nations. The true question at present is whether the Southern states shall or shall not be parties to the union. If the convention thinks that North Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia will ever agree to the plan unless their right to import enslaved people be untouched, that expectation is in vain. The people of those states will never be such fools as to give up so important an interest. And so you can see the starkness, it's a chilling, chilling reminder of the concrete stakes here and the arguments that are being made on the floor. In the end, what the convention delegates agreed to is uh, to say that Congress initially will have no power to end the international slave trade, but Congress will then get that power in 1808. And this is really significant because that's a 20 year period between ratification and when Congress gets the power to ban the international slave trade and Congress does it, they do it in 1808 as soon as they can. But in that 20 years, we see an additional uh, 200,000 enslaved people come from Africa. And that's, that's almost as many as came into the United States for the first 170 years of American history. So the personal, the human stakes are unbelievably high here. And the last thing I'll sort of say about these base curry is they're obviously disturbing, they're troubling. And we really just have to come to grips with sort of the balance between how do we think of these compromises? How important do we think they were to the constitution actually getting done in Philadelphia? And then importantly, what effect do they have moving forward? And if I'm thinking of, you know, what, what do we take away from these debates? You know, a couple of big things. One is that plenty of the delegates fought to make sure the word slavery didn't appear in the constitution. Plenty of delegates, delegates pushed to ensure the constitution didn't clearly protect a right to property and men. So it left the question of slavery to the states. States end up deciding whether to abolish slavery or not. But finally, what they were willing to do was they were willing to compromise. Even anti-slavery delegates were willing to compromise with Southern slaveholding states to ensure that we can form a new government, sign it, send it to the American people to be ratified, and then fight for ratification. And some of the framers, those who oppose slavery, they predicted that you know maybe in a generation or two, slavery would die out. Here's a quote from Oliver Ellsworth from Connecticut. Slavery in time will not be a speck in our country. That's the prediction. If only, if only that yeah, were true. Absolutely. And it's such a huge part of the convention that we still discuss and debate today. When we, when we have major writers of history having this discussion and debate on modern 
articles and modern blog posts that this is why we look at these pieces and understand where the framing is coming from. And then how do we understand this today? So at the very end, we think we go back to this modern constitution that we have. And just for some kind of like framing of reference, the constitution is signed by the majority of people in the room. Three people refuse to sign. They're the dissenters. We lovingly call them the dissenters. They have to sign that constitution to say, this is what we believe is our best effort and we back this document. It is taken to the printers in Philadelphia. It takes two days to be put and set into print and then is, is handed out in the Pennsylvania packet. We have one of the original documents at the National Constitution Center. So if you're ever in Philadelphia, come visit us and we can check it out together. It is one of my favorite pieces because it's the first time the people see the document. That document is then sent to states for ratifying delegations. That ratification happens on June 21st, 1788. So I think it's really funny that this is one of the few celebrations and holidays, Constitution Day, that we celebrate the day it was signed and not the day it was ratified. Usually we celebrate when it becomes law, not when we turn it to the world. But this was a huge deal. It's turned back to the people and given to the people to say, do you choose this document? Again, that belief in popular sovereignty and their choice. The Bill of Rights is added on December 15th, 1791. And then the final amendment to that constitution, that number 27 is added in 1992. So 233 years of this document and its ability to change. But Tom, thank you so much for walking us through this history, the debates of that moment and how they resonate today in our conversations and our dialogue.